Dr. Sven Hackinson is short, but his broad shoulders, trim figure, and unflinching eye contact more than make up for his stature. He says it's been a long week and feeling a bit low on energy, but as we walk through the Native American exhibit, can't help but notice a certain spring in his step. He speaks softly, but with notable passion. Sven is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Washington and a curator of North American anthropology at the Burke Museum. What's important for me and the work I have the privilege to do is working with communities and collaborating with communities to allow them to um, take back knowledge that's been taken out of their communities and, and put it back into a living context so it's relevant, um, so it shows um, who they are culturally, so it shows um, their brilliance um, and celebrates that. For over 300 years, Alaska has been occupied and colonized. Native kids were sent away to boarding schools and tribal elders were forced to abandon traditions that go back hundreds and hundreds of years. Sven personally knows what it's like to grow up in a culture whose history has been virtually erased. He's a member of the Supiat tribe and was raised in Old Harbor, Kodiak Island, where the harmful effects of Alaska's colonization are still present today. I was growing up, you know, we'd hear this, oh, you dumb savage, you dumb native, you know, you dumb this and dumb that, and, and look down on it. When you were inculcated into that, when you were brought up thinking that, yeah, you don't have much value for yourself. I mean, the suicide and dropout rates for natives is horrible. I mean, so it's just it's just horrible. It's like why are why are all these amazing kids that you know up until sixth, seventh, eighth grade are amazing, and then all of a sudden it switches. Ninth grade, there was nine of us that started in my village. Only two of us graduated. Um, dropped out, suicide, I mean, you name it, they went through jail, all of it. But out of nine of us, only two. Growing up, Sven spent his free time building model boats and planes. The A-10 Warthog was his favorite. He loved reading National Geographic, too, poring over every issue, always thirsty for more. It was this curiosity for world cultures that motivated him to go to college. But all those hours spent immersed in the pages of Nat Geo, with all those cultures and traditions from around the globe on vivid display, Sven couldn't help but notice the sparse state of the Supiat tribe's own culture. We didn't have kayaks. We didn't have mask making. We didn't have any of this knowledge in our living context. When you strip away a person's cultural identity, Sven explains, and all the traditions and values that go with it, you create a void and people will always look to fill that. What do you think you're gonna fill that with? The violence, the anger, the alcohol, the abuse. And you have all of that happening. And speed that forward, you have those generations teaching, next generation, next generation. We become self-fulfilling prophecies of who we are based on what we've been taught. This, Sven says, is why it's so important to focus on putting these lost traditions back into a living context. He says when people are given the knowledge of who they are and where they come from, you give them a reason to live. Is you taking your own life worth it? Because you are valuable because of this. You are valuable to the next generation for what not only you know, but what you can do. It's giving value back to that person as a human being. And to me, that is powerful. In 2013, Sven came across a mislabeled model kayak. He realized it was a model Angyak, a type of kayak unique to the Sukput tribe, the traditional knowledge and construction of which was thought to have been lost. Using this approximately two-foot-long model as a guide, he began to reverse engineer it. With the help of traditional boat builders, Sven was able to recreate the model Angyak using only traditional methods. No glue, no nails. Daddy, I know how to carve now. You can do it you can. In 2014, Sven traveled back to Kodiak to share what he had learned with the Sukhpiat people. 
He brought prepared kits so the children could make their own model ungat and learn about the traditional methods of its construction. Sven was unsure at first whether or not the kids would be interested in building a boat that they knew nothing about. But then two boys from that group, who consistently struggled with academia, caught Sven's attention. We had a teacher go, or no, actually the other, one of the other kids and the teacher go, oh, those boys, they're not going to do anything. Yeah, good luck. They're worthless. Those are the two boys I had to ask to leave at 10 o'clock at night because they were so into it, so into making the model kayaks. They would come in at 8 o'clock in the morning, and at 10 o'clock, we'd be like, okay, we got to get some sleep so we can be ready for you tomorrow. Can you guys go? I'm sitting there going, at the end of the week, I'm like, if you think these boys are lazy, if you think these boys are stupid, you don't know them. Sven says it was an experience that helped him further dismiss the narrative of the dumb, primitive natives. A narrative that becomes even flimsier when you begin looking at the brilliance of design and some of their traditional tools. As I was learning about the Anyak and reverse engineering this and coming to learn about this bulbous bow, which still blows my mind about how it works. And I was talking with a, a Navy officer who then said, oh yeah, they, they use supercomputers in the nose of a dolphin as modeling for putting that bulbous bow on those large ocean-going vessels. The young yuck has a unique bow that helps it split waves and redirects the energy to help propel the boat through rough waters. This design is perfect for combating the harsh and unpredictable waters of the Bering Sea. So that was really amazing in terms of just like, wow, talk about the cultural ingenuity and the brilliance involved in designing that bulbous bow from my tribe that goes back over a thousand years. That's not so stupid, is it? Another example, the traditional clinket halibut hook. It's formed from two carved pieces of wood and bound together in a Y shape with a nail punched through one of the arms of the Y. The angles and the length of each part of the hook have to be rather specific though, because it's designed to only catch halibut of a certain size. The younger, smaller halibut that have yet to breed can't quite get their mouths around the hook, and the much larger breeding halibut can release the hook if they do bite. This design helps restrict fishermen from catching the halibut important to maintaining a healthy breeding population. How do we um, go and look at what communities were doing in their environments? The communities that were from those areas, what were they doing to thrive? To not over harvest their material, to find a way to live sustainably, not beyond their means, sustainably. And, and then what were they doing? How can we start implementing some of those practices? Sven and his students continue to work on projects like the halibut hook carving, and recently, making traditional raincoats from bear intestines. Although it's unlikely that bear intestine rain jackets will be flying onto shelves anytime soon, Sven says it's a good exercise in thinking about how to use local materials, as well as an opportunity for students to learn by doing. Now when Sven visits his family in Kodiak, he sees carved masks and model Ongyak boats proudly displayed in their homes. He sees his community taking pride in their traditions and culture and dispelling the label of the dumb savage that took Sven years to shake off.